I should say that this program is a real pleasure for me because I had to introduce, I have to introduce two friends and to listen to another friend of mine, so I really feel good. And now's the time to introduce Professor Vipin Kumar from University of Minnesota. Uh, Vipin started his career as a theoretician, uh, working on algorithms and on more practical models or more realistic model of parallel complexity. He did, uh, he developed later Metis and Parmetis, who are used to this day as the main tools for graph partitioning and mesh partitioning. And now for a long time, he has been focusing on big data. He has been focusing on big data before big data become a term that is so widely used and uh, has done a lot of work on uh, uh, mining scientific uh, data, which will be the topic uh, of his talk. So it's my pleasure to have Vipin here. Thank you, Mark. All right. Um, again, thanks uh, 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 to the committee for for um, uh, for this award, and I like to really. Um, dedicated to my students uh, who, and collaborators whose, whose work, of course, has made it all possible. So I chose to talk about um, uh, this topic um, for a number of reasons. One of them, of course, is Bill Kemp mentioned in his opening talk today that climate uh, is one of the greatest challenge for our society. And the question is, what could this community uh, do for it? And second thing is, the, it's a, a journey that I started in this direction only because of my involvement with this conference about 17 years ago. So I was giving a, a series of tutorials over a period of years on the topic of scalable analytics. There was no big data in 98, 99. So the tutorial was uh, named Scalable Analytics. It was a huge audience even back then. And then at the end, somebody from NASA came up and said, hey, we, got big, we got lots of data. You, you can work with us. And that sort of started a journey that basically uh, uh, we sort of have been on uh, uh, for, for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> now, the, uh, if you look at the information about our climate and environment, and if you look back about 50 years ago, the amount of information we had was very, very limited. The, the transition from small data to big data is almost of the same order, or perhaps even a bigger order, as you saw in yesterday's keynote talk. You know, today, everybody carries PDAs, internet, everything. You have so much more information about yourself. And very much similar things can be said about uh, uh, the data, big data in climate. And it's, of course, reaching up to hundreds of petabytes and, 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 and moving on many, many orders of magnitudes greater than that. And this community has contributed, supercomputing community has con contributed to this big data in many, many different ways. And one of them is you can see the example of on the top right corner, these uh, climate simulation models. They, they're called general circulation models or GCMs. And these models have become more and more sophisticated, more and more detailed, and as Bill said, if we have eight orders of more computing power than ever, right, we will be able to perhaps understand enough about our environment that we can give very precise, actionable guidance. But uh, uh, even today, uh, when you check your weather for the next hour or for the next 12 hours, for the next seven days, the similar technology is sort of driving those decisions. So a lot of this is already happening. And if you, look, if you looked at the same simulations from 20 years ago, they would look very clumsy. Uh, uh, they won't be reflecting as much of the physics. Uh, and every decade, every, every five years, every decade, they, they get better and better. You know, uh, the scaling, I think Bill talked about, was uh, square root of three. And it, it, just, it just marches on. Okay? So that's one aspect of big data. And that's, that's being uh, uh, enabled by faster and faster computers that are coming primarily from this community and the kind of software that uh, Bill Graff talked about. Then there's another uh, kind of data that's sort of again coming in, and which is this. You're seeing here the animation of satellites uh, just from NASA. 
circling the Earth and taking pictures. And then, of course, they've been, uh, they started flying about four decades ago, and then they, more and more of them are sort of coming in. So this is, this is a lot of data here. You combine these two, you have reanalysis data, you have other kind of sensors data, and then it just goes on. There are massive amount of data that's being collected about our climate. As a result, even the climate science community now believes that the climate science is actually a big data science. Okay? Uh, it's, for better or worse, big data has become the, the right word. So I'll have, we'll have to sort of keep using that. Okay? So it's a big science comparable in magnitude, complexity, and importance to human genomics, which decidedly about 30 years ago started taking the turn and nobody would doubt that you could do anything in genomics without big data and big computing that's inherent uh, in them. So this is, this is sort of the, 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 the journey that sort of brings, this is sort of the evolution that brings two communities together. And on my own, even though my journey started about 17 years ago, uh, right here, looking at these kind of data sets, working in collaboration with scientists uh, at NASA and other, other uh, 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 disciplines. Uh, uh, and more recently, we have been involved in this project funded by the Computer Science Division of NSF, which is specifically on understanding climate change using sort of a big data approach. Okay? And, and this has been a journey. This is, of course, we have lots of collaborators, multiple institutions who are part of it. Half the team is computer scientists, half the team is from other disciplines. And uh, it has been uh, um, a, a, a fantastic journey in which machine learning techniques, the kind of techniques you heard in the talks uh, uh, yesterday morning, keynote, uh, how do you advance them? How do you make them amenable to this climate data? And how do you sort of derive new insights? And I'll just give a few examples here. Um, for example, on the top, uh, uh, top left here, you see uh, the data from the altimeters uh, from the satellite being collected and that data being used to figure out the dynamics in the ocean. It's like an observation record of dynamics in the ocean of all the ocean eddies. Of course, one way to find about ocean eddies is to put a little buoy and you see if the ocean eddy sort of goes through it, it will circle around, but those are very hard to put in and how many can you put in across the ocean. But looking at this data from the satellite and by using the smart machine learning algorithms, you can build the historical record of the last many, many decades of what was happening in the ocean and use that to figure out going forward as to how the climate change might impact it uh, and, and so forth. On the lower left side, you're seeing uh, uh, another example of, of big data technology being used uh, uh, in, in, in climate science, which is you take the, the records of temperature and pressure uh, on the Earth's surface for many, many decades or centuries. You convert them into networks, uh, and once you convert them to networks, they look more like social networks uh, that you would get from uh, Facebook analysis and so forth. And once you have those networks, you can analyze them for patterns, for relationships, for teleconnections, uh, 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 things like El Nino phenomena and related, I mean, some of them are no, well known, but how about the other ones that are not known to people? And, and this kind of analysis has resulted in a range of new phenomena that was never known to computer scientists before. So it's like the, it's the first example of uh, computer science algorithms driving uh, new uh, climate science uh, 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 new, new patterns. We're able to take this data from the satellites about the Earth's surface and uh, build the histories of what has happened to our forests, how are they being converted from to plantations, to uh, agriculture. So you can look at the dynamics of the Earth's surface by, by taking these data sets and, and putting them into uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. And just to give you a sense of the data as to how complex and how big it can be, I'll just talk about uh, one of these satellites, uh, actually one of these pair of satellites, Tara and Aqua, they have an instrument called MODIS, and it's taking a picture of the Earth every single day. So if you look at this Salt Lake City Center, it's being pictured every single day. Uh, uh, every location on the globe is pictured every single day at a resolution of about 250 meters by 250 meters. So if you have a square kilometer area on the Earth, there'll be about 16 pixels being taken uh, uh, from there. And this data is being collected, archived, and made available to the entire world uh, for analysis. And this is just one satellite data. You can convert this data into spatial frames. You can convert them into temporal frames. 
Uh, and then it just offers opportunities, uh, tremendous opportunities for analyzing you know, what's happening to our Earth, how is it changing, how are we impacting it, how climate change may be impacting it, and you will see some examples of that uh, in, in a few moments. And this is just one satellite, and you know, the, uh, one sensor MODIS, then you have Landsat, which is about, you know, which is much, much finer resolution in space, but much coarser in time. And then you go on to more recent technologies that are circling the Earth uh, uh, and, and, and sort of providing much, maybe five to 10 orders of more magnitude data in space and time. So given these data sets, it, it makes it possible for us to analyze uh, uh, and these data sets and answer many, many questions. And I will just, just to keep things simple, uh, uh, given my limited time, I'll talk about just one example, and that is one of being able to monitor the state of water on the surface of the Earth uh, at a level of detail that was never possible before. So wh why somebody should be interested in global surface water dynamics? Because water is a big problem. Climate change is happening, but one of the bigger impact of that would be uh, one, of the, one of the biggest possible uh, negative consequences of that would be on water security. And even, even without climate change, because of our population growth and, 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 and many, many other factors, the uh, uh, water is a serious problem globally, and you can see uh, many of these headlights uh, from newspapers and so forth. Okay? It turns out that you could use big data from the satellite and machine learning algorithms uh, to analyze them because, you, of course, you have lots of data sets you know, from satellites like, uh, from sensors like MODIS and Landsat. And you could use that to, uh, to build a machine learning model to figure out uh, which locations and, and which time happen to be water or not water. And there are some ground truth available, of course. You know, uh, for example, in February of 2000, uh, NASA flew a special mission of the, sp of the space shuttle to map the Earth on the world. So we have a very good sense of how the water looked like on February 2000. But th so that can serve as a training ground for us. And the question is, can we use that to build a, a dynamics of what, what has been happening across the globe over the years? And it becomes a very challenging machine learning problem for a number of reasons. <clears throat> and, and those of you who have dabbled in machine learning would appreciate that. That is, the, the samples uh, of water and non-water, it may look like a very simple problem, but actually it could be a very difficult problem if you're trying to solve it on a global scale. Uh, and, and the reason is that in the spectral space in which we are viewing this data from the satellite, the nature of water and land can look very, very different in different parts of the world. And just to give an example, I'm showing you on the, on the, on the top here, there are three different lakes. They're all being viewed in a composite, uh, an RGB uh, composite. It's not a true color composite, it's a false color composite. And you can sort of see that the land and water, the middle part of the water, the surrounding part is land, they look very, very different. Which, which means that if you build a classifier using one of these samples, it's entirely possible that they would, it would do very poorly in the other part. And to make matter worse, the same region over a period of two different times can look very different. On the lower side, you see the same lake in Argentina on two different dates, and it looks very, very different. What makes it even worse is that when you view this data from the satellite, there are a whole bunch of missing data. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of errors in the data. And in this example that I'm showing you is a Poyang Lake, one of the largest freshwater lakes in, in China, used to feed a lot of people, uh, give, give water to a lot of people. But every time you see the pink color, very prominent color, the data is missing. It's not there. Okay? So when you have situations like this, it's very, very hard uh, to, to handle this. And it turns out that you have to sort of require machinery, different types of algorithms and machinery to be able to, to handle these challenges. There are advances that we had to make in ensemble learning and to handle the heterogeneity. There's a lot of talk about, in situations like these, to be able to use the domain knowledge, the physics, and you combine them with machine learning. So how do you guide your machine learning algorithms uh, 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 um, and combine it uh, 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 with physics? Uh, and it turns out, in the case of water bodies, you have all water bodies happen to be uh, in a bold shape, so if you happen to know the exact elevation, you can make a lot of these corrections uh, globally, except that you don't have the elevation data at the level of detail that you need. So how do you design a machine alg algorithm that can take this information into account and still get the job done? So there are a whole bunch of such challenges that have to be, uh, to be handled. And this is just to sort of give you a, a sense of some of the data sets and some of the, the computing resources that we had to use. 
So the data sets can be large at different levels of the details. It's sort of showing you, if you, have, if you look at the spectral data from a certain perspective on a single day, it's very, very small. If you go to high resolution satellites, it become more detailed. If you look at the uh, 15 years of data, you're talking about already about four orders of magnitude increase in the data. So by the time you get done, the data set become hundreds of terabytes, which becomes very, very hard for you to handle on traditional supercomputers. Uh, and then the algorithms that go into processing these, again, are, are highly computer intensive. So, so a lot of this work actually is done on the NASA's Earth Exchange, which, which sort of has made these things. I mean, this is one of the traditional uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, supercomputer with about seven petaflops uh, peak information. So, but but in, in addition to the high computing power that we have on this, uh, on the NEX, the biggest utility that we find is the fact that NASA has all of these data sets available locally. So that makes it so much easier to run a lot of these computations back and forth without having to worry about moving the data. So now, let me just give you a sense of how all of this data that we have about the, the Earth system and some of the samples we have from the shuttle's uh, 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 flight from February 2000 has been able to build a system that you can go if you're sitting in the audience, you can go to this link, uh, z.yaman.edu slash monitoring water, and you have at your fingertips, just with the access of a web viewer, the ability to see what's happening to the surface water globally for the last 17 years. Okay? You can, uh, and it's basically, it's right now, it's running on the MODIS uh, data, so it, it requires um, uh, any web, uh, we, we, we pick up any, water body that's at least 10 pixels wide. And it, it, the, some of the key highlights are it detects melting of glacial lakes, changes in river morphology, uh, building of dams worldwide, which people didn't know much about before, uh, at a level of detail that we're going to be able to provide, and all sorts of other relationships that will be very hard uh, to find. So this is how, if, if you go to the system, and if you click on some locations, these blue dots will start appearing. Each blue dot will sort of tell you that there's a water body uh, at, at that location. If you go to the southern United States, you will see blue dots like these. Okay? If you happen to touch one of these blue dots, let's say this one, and if you look at the picture from the, uh, from the Google Earth, it's actually Don Martin Dam in, in Mexico. Okay? If you ask the system to sort of tell you how, what were the dynamics of this place over a period of last 15, 16 years, it's telling you that the size of this water body was very small in the beginning, in 2000. It shrank, and then in 2005, it became peak. Then it came down, and it came up, and down, and so forth. So you can have the entire dynamics uh, uh, this way, okay? Now, of course, the system can tell you a lot more. And just to sort of give you sort of a validation as to why you should think that this is really happening, you can see, for some of these images, you can see the time-lapse image from Google. And you can see this area growing and shrinking exactly at the same synchronicity as this time series. So if, if, if you, from far away, you cannot see the date on the Google time lapse, but they actually match perfectly. So this sort of gives you a sense of power that you have, all made possible by big data, lots of computing power, and lots of smart algorithms that you have on your fingertip. You can sort of analyze what's happening to the water uh, on the globe. Now, we can color these nodes differently. We can say, well, some of these locations that are water may be growing. Some of them may be shrinking. So whenever they're growing, we made them red dots. Whenever they were shrinking, they are uh, green dots. So it gives you a little bit more information. If you're not either growing or shrinking, you're not shown in this map. Okay? You can already see these little lots of these dots, some places totally red, some places totally green. And for example, in South America, there's a whole area here, huge massive area with lots of green dots. What's happening here? If you zoom into Google Earth, you see a lot of agriculture uh, taking place here. You go and you sort of say, how much of this total area is growing and shrinking? And it turns out that the total amount of pixels, if you count in the water, the MODIS pixels, is about 10,000 pixels have grown and then shrunk. And 10,000 pixels is a lot of space. It's, like, it's about 2,500 square kilometers worth of area that's, that's growing and shrinking. Okay? You can see one of these dots, again on Google Earth, growing and shrinking pretty much at the same, in the same mechanics. You can come back to the US and, and then see places close to home, like places like Colorado River. You can see that growing and shrinking. You know, of course, it's, it's mostly shrinking. Uh, it, it has a tremendous impact because of the uh, loss of water in because of climate change. You see another area, Lake Powell. Uh, uh, 
you see the different dynamics there. Yeah? Now, here is something that will be pretty shocking. Here is the system was built. We were not looking for anything. And we see a whole bunch of red dots clustered in this range in Himalayas, right up there. Okay? And of course, if many of you, of course, know Tibet is one of the highest places. This is the home for uh, uh, Himalayas, the, the, the Everest. And then you have lots of glaciers there. And these glaciers feed rivers that impact about 2 billion people on the Earth. So it's, it's like the massive, uh, uh, what happens here impacts a huge part of humanity. Okay? And what's happening here, if you go look into these red spots, okay? So I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to expand in some portions here. And you see this bigger area here. And you can see here very specific red spots, which are specific regions of, the, of this area that actually grow. Okay? You can go to another box there. You see another whole bunch of red areas there. All of these areas grew over a period of time in the last 15, 16 years. Okay? Again, for many of them, actually nearly for all of them, you can look at the Google time-lapse image just focusing on them, and you can see these areas were very, very small before and then just grew. You can see the blue water sort of growing. Right? You can see that in other places and, you can, and, and, and so forth. You can sort of keep doing it. You can sort of keep seeing it in all, all of different places. right? And if you sort of measure what happened to the total amount of water in this area, it turns out again about 40,000 new pixels emerge of water, which you're talking about almost 10,000 square kilometer of water emerging in, in the middle of mountains. Now, this water, of course, is coming in because glaciers are melting. And then that, that means that has consequences on what the humanity will have to bear in about 50 years or, or 100 years when these glaciers are completely gone. So this is sort of an example of what, what, what can happen or what can be analyzed, right? I'll just move on with a few more examples. You see an area here with a whole bunch of red and green dots okay, right next to each other. In the previous example, there were a whole bunch of red dots together, a whole bunch of green dots together. You see a whole bunch of red and green dots right next to each other. What could be happening here? Some area is growing and some area is shrinking. If you look at them very carefully, especially in an area, and if you watch them, if you're really close to the screen, you will be able to see that this is something there's something going on with the river dynamics. If you look at a red dot, of course, it's increasing. If you look at a green dot, it's decreasing. And if you watch in this area the Google time-lapse images, you can see in front of your eyes these rivers. And of course, this process is happening over a period of 15 years. But you can see this dynamics happening. Okay? And you can see more of this here, and then and so forth. Right? This goes on. And why this is happening? Because when the deforestation happens in the Amazon, a lot of the, the sand and the silt sort of goes into the river, and that makes them a lot more prone to meandering. So there are all sorts of hydrological phenomena that one can study uh, and in connection to human impact and the climate change uh, when you have this kind of information. You see these red dots and green dots across the ocean boundaries as well, because a lot of these boundaries on the ocean are eroding and so forth. You can see the green dot, uh, red dot increasing, green dot decreasing, and if you see the dynamics here, you will sort of see uh, oh, let me do one more time. And you can see the sand shifting from one side to the other. I, I don't have an example here, but you can see entire islands shrinking because of erosion uh, uh, over a period of time. So you can see many, many things. One of the more recent things we have done with this is look at how are the dams being constructed globally. They have a huge impact on the ecology. Of course, they're important for energy, hydroenergy, but they have huge impact on the ecology. Uh, of any area, and, and, uh, and, then, and you can easily see them uh, uh, from, from, the, from this analysis. Um, and, and it turns out there is a global reservoir and dam database called GRAN, developed by the hydrological community, which is supposed to keep track of all the dams in the world. And it shows about 35 new dam constructions after 2001. And it turns out and this is where they are. And using our machinery uh, from the software, you can actually find about close to 700 dams. So you, you can see them all over the world. You can see them in Brazil. You can see them in India. You can see them in China, all the places you will expect. And, and you can basically do this kind of analysis in a much more intelligent way as opposed to saying, well, I don't know exactly what's going on in the world in terms of uh, these, these dams. So <clears throat> just to summarize the, the system that sort of 
is built for monitoring water globally. It can actually have a lot of different possibilities. One of them is what, is what are the different stocks of water and how are they changing and what may be the risks uh, involved with respect to climate change or, or, or uh, population increase. You can see the mapping uh, of uh, river discharge. And that may be, uh, you, can, you, you can sort of uh, reverse cross boundaries from one nation to the other. And oftentimes, people don't have a good record of how much water is going from one country to the other. Using this technology and with, with some other innovations, you can actually come up with a very good way of figuring out how much water is flowing through these riverway systems. You can, impact, you can assess the impact of climate change and human actions uh, you saw in Tibet. And you can improve these hydrological models that, are, uh, that, that often are run with very incomplete information. So with that, let me just uh, conclude by saying that big data holds great promise in increasing our understanding of the Earth's climate and environment, uh, 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 but from a very different perspective than just simply improving climate models. And I think these are both complementary approaches. And they, uh, together, they have a lot more uh, 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 possibility of impact. And uh, the big challenges from the perspective of this community are that these data sets are very, very large. And oftentimes, we may have to move the computing to the data as opposed to bring the data wherever it is uh, to your supercomputing center. A big question becomes on how do you scale the machine learning algorithms to run on, on these very large data sets. Uh, and some of the questions are easy, which ones we have handled. But a lot of them are really difficult and that, that need to be pursued. Uh, and a big, big. Uh, path that one, we are sort of uh, moving on is how do you bring in the scientific theory and machine learning together to be able to advance science. With that, let me, let me uh, uh, thank you all for your attention. And here are some of the students who were part of this, this work that you just saw earlier. Thank you. Thank you for a big talk on big data. Uh, questions? You have microphones if you want to ask questions. If not, we shall thank the speaker again. <laughs>